So uh, what do we know about substitution and elimination reactions? Uh, lots of possibilities. How do we keep it all straight? Your starting materials for a substitution and an elimination reaction are an alkyl halide and either a nucleophile or a base or something that's both or perhaps neither. That was helpful, right? Uh, nucleophile slash base. And we can go the SN2 pathway. Recall that SN2 describes a concerted mechanism where we make the new bond between carbon and the nucleophile while we break the old bond between carbon and the leaving group. Um, recall that this happens uh, via backside attack because that's where the LUMO or Sigma star is and the consequence of that is inversion of stereochemistry. So the mechanism of an E uh, one, I'm sorry, an SN1 reaction if, say, we had this leaving group and we used a nucleophile would be this stereochemistry. Uh, what do we know about rate of, these, of the SN2 reaction and how it depends on the nucleophile and uh, the alkyl halide? Well, we know that good nucleophiles uh, attack the alpha carbon uh, before, or in other words, maybe the best way to say this is um, SN2 reactions are favored by good nucleophiles because good nucleophiles aren't going to wait around for the leaving group to leave if they, yeah, unless they have to. When might they have to? Well, uh, as we increase the bulk uh, around the alkyl halide, as we go from primary to secondary, the tertiary alkyl halides, we see by the time we get to tertiary alkyl halides that there's no reaction because, uh, uh, because of sterics. <clears throat> Whereas uh, the reaction is fast for primary alkyl halides and a bit slower, but still doable for secondary alkyl halides. All right. Uh, so all of those issues are important in predicting what's going to happen. The most likely thing to compete <clears throat> with the SN2 reaction is the E2 reaction, the elimination. The two here refers to the fact that both the nucleophile and, or rather the base, and the alkyl halide are involved in the rate law. The E2 reaction involves breaking a bond between the carbon and the beta proton. It involves breaking the bond between the alpha carbon and the leaving group. That's a little alpha. And then we make a new carbon-carbon pi bond between alpha and beta. And one thing that we often forget is we also make a new sigma bond between whatever our base is and the proton. <clears throat> so elimination products are going to be... Um, olefins or alkenes and uh, in the case of our starting material here that we used above if we have something that's a strong base we can expect elimination products uh, that include the following possibilities each beta proton that can be anti to the leaving group is something you need to consider and we went through this example last time and, and noted that uh, we've got three different kinds of beta protons here. Um, we've got the ones on the methyl group. I'm trying to decide what color to use. We've got uh, purple beta proton and blue beta proton. Uh, those two are diastereotopic. They are different and they lead to different products, the cis versus the trans disubstituted product. With the E2 reaction, we've said that the most stable product is the major product. Olefin or alkene stability is a function of sterics, so trans is more favorable than cis. And it's a function of substitution. That is, more substituted alkenes or olefins, uh, more non-hydrogen things attached to the vinyl carbon are more stable because of sigma to pi star hyperconjugation involving the alkyl groups 
that are attached to the vinyl carbons. Um, so those are the mechanistic details for E2. As with SN2, which is favored by good nucleophiles, E2 is favored by good bases. Good bases won't wait for the leaving group to leave before they attack. In terms of rate, uh, the, the effective alkyl halide structure on the rate of the E2 reaction may be something we haven't mentioned so far. It's actually opposite to that of SN2. It is fastest for tertiary alkyl halides and uh, it is way slow for primary alkyl halides and it's okay for secondary <coughs> alkyl halides. And maybe I should put okay for the rate of SN2 for secondary alkyl halides as well. So you have this inverted preference between SN2 and E2 in terms of their dependence on the stability uh, or, or dependence on the structure of the alkyl halide. Uh, remember too that uh, there's this requirement, the stereochemical outcome of E2 reaction depends on anti-periplanar arrangement of the beta proton and the leaving group. And remember also that you've got some regiochemical or regioselectivity issues. That is the more stable alkene, the more substituted alkene is the, is the, more, uh, is the major product. All right? Yes? Okay, can you go over what are some good nucleophiles and what are some good bases? Sure. Um, so we've got a rule of thumb for good nucleophiles, and this is just based on empirical data, just based on experiments. Uh, good nucleophiles uh, have conjugate acids. Good nucleophiles have conjugate acids with pKa's that are greater than zero. Pretty much anything with a negative charge on it. Uh, and we could talk about items that satisfy that uh, criteria. These would include, um, wait, and then uh, good bases. Uh, good, again, is a relative term relative to what, and the dividing point that we've sort of chosen is uh, good relative to hydroxide. Good bases have conjugate acids with pKa's that are greater than or equal to 16. So examples would include hydroxide, uh, methoxide, ethoxide, all of the alkoxides, tert butoxide. Now some of these are also going to show up on our list of good nucleophiles. And so we're going to have to think about our nucleophile slash base and whether it's a good nucleophile versus whether it's a good base. And um, we'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Is that sort of what? Yeah? Okay, what else? Yeah? For a secondary alkyl halide, you have to do a similar thing with SN1 D1 where you have to write off all the products. Is there a way to find E2 or SN2 in which mechanism is going to be preferable in the nature? Okay, so when, I think the question here in class is when SN2 and E2 compete, is there a way to tell whether one will be preferred versus the other? Um, Yes, and we'll go through that. I think before I answer that, though, I want to bring in the other option that we've already talked about, which is where the carbocation leaves first. Is it okay if I pause, if I wait on that? Okay. So if we don't have a good nucleophile or a good base, and and or if uh, we're dealing with uh, an alkyl halide that can't react via an SN2 reaction. Uh, then we have to wait for the leaving group to leave. And this is uh, the slow step. And it gives us, it's the rate determining step of the reactions that follow. It gives us a carbocation intermediate. And uh, the carbocation intermediate is least 
stable for primary carbocations, so much that we won't really see these as viable intermediates. Uh, and it's okay for secondary, and it's the better of the possible options for the tertiary carbocations. So, you know, whether or not you can go in this direction versus bounce around up here depends on how unstable the carbocationic intermediate is because the transition state where the leaving group leaves is carbocation-like, and that was where we talked about the Hammond postulate. Once, though, we get to the carbocation, we can do SN1, where the nucleophile attacks the um, positively charged carbon, so we attack at the alpha carbon. In, for the example uh, shown above, if we had something that was a weak nucleophile slash weak base, the leaving group would leave first, we would get a carbocation, and then the nucleophile could come in and attack that alpha carbon, the positively charged carbon, from above or below to give us both possible products. And so showing those two possible stereochemical configurations is essential to demonstrating that you know what the SN1 reaction is. Uh, similarly, once we get to that carbocationic intermediate, we can attack the beta proton to get elimination products. Uh, and again, if this were our starting material and we were dealing with uh, a nucleophile that was a weak nucleophile slash weak base, for example, like methanol, uh, again, you would get to the same carbocationic intermediate and then you would ask, okay, where are the beta protons in that carbocationic intermediate? Aligning anti to the leaving group no longer matters because the leaving group is gone. The only thing that matters is whether you can get these beta protons to line up with the empty p orbital on the positively charged carbon, whether that's above or below the plane of the page, doesn't matter. Um, and so we would expect for this molecule the same products that we saw for the E2 reaction, and we would also expect the more stable alkene to be the major product. But remember that once you get to the carbocationic intermediate, which is very reactive, there is basically no selectivity between SN1 and E1. SN1 and E1 always compete. And so, uh, and we won't, though we could identify a major elimination product, we will not uh, choose or try to decide whether substitution dominates over elimination in a case where a reaction is E1 versus SN1. Yeah? So they don't compete, that means that there's a mixture of both. That's right. That, that means that you would show all of these as the product of the SN1 reaction. Uh, now, Curtis, you asked something which I told you I would address, and then I promptly forgot it. So. Okay. Secondary alkyl halide, uh, SN2 versus E2. Well, there's two possibilities. Uh, if you have a secondary alkyl halide like this, I don't know, let's just choose that since there's stereo centers in it, and then that allows us to illustrate some things. It would depend. If you have a good nucleophile that is a weak base, Remember, weak bases don't attack first. They have to wait for the leaving group to leave. Therefore, the only thing that matters is the nucleophilic character. Now, an example of a good nucleophile that is a weak base would include CN minus, whose conjugate acid is HCN, which has a pKa of nine. That's more, uh, more basic than water, but less basic than, uh, more reactive than water, but way less basic than, say, hydroxide. So it's not going to remove any, any beta protons. Um, there are some other examples we can talk about and that are discussed in your study guide. So we would expect 
only to see SN2 products. And so the way we would draw that would just be like this. Uh, alternatively, what if we used something that was both a good nucleophile and a good base? Uh, an example of this might be hydroxide. Uh, its conjugate acid is water, which has a pKa of 16. So we would expect to see, and then we would need to remember that for secondary alkyl halides, E2 and SN2 are both okay. So we expect them to compete. We've got something that has both nucleophile and base character. It's good at both. So you expect to see a mixture of elimination and uh, substitution products. Uh, again, not, not being required to say which was major or minor. Perhaps you go in the lab and do this and discover, hey, we got lucky, we only get substitution products, then yay, uh, you can celebrate. But if you do the reaction and your yield is really low, uh, maybe you decide to start go looking for elimination products to see if that's uh, a competitive issue, okay? So we're just being aware of possibilities. We're not trying to predict things that we don't, that aren't predictable. Um, is that? Yeah, I had another question about the leaving group. If the leaving group is strong enough, does that play a role in, or is that not predictable? That's a good question. What if the leaving group gets better? Well, the leaving group matters for SN2 and for E2 and for going to the carbocation. So I don't know whether the leaving group points you down any particular pathway. Um, poor leaving groups probably won't go, oh, the Apple Pencil battery is low. That's good. So we'll plug it in for like 30 seconds. Poor leaving groups uh, probably will not do SN1 or E1 because the leaving group has to leave first. And so that probably shuts down SN1 and E1. Um, and it can shut down SN2 and E2. So it's not a great predictor of what the mechanism will be, or at least not one that we'll really use. Um, so folks at home are wanting to see, well, what happens if you used for this secondary alkyl halide something that was a good base but a weak nucleophile? Uh, an example of this, uh, oops, is weak nucleophile, but good base. Uh, the reason for that these might exist would be sterics. They can't, they're not good at attacking uh, alpha carbons, but can attack the much smaller beta carbons. There are a couple other sterically hindered bases that are mentioned in your text. You don't need to memorize their names or what their structures are, but you may see them in problems. Uh, these sterically hindered bases don't do SN2 your secondary alkyl halide could do SN2 or E2, but the nature of your base is that it will give you E2 only, which would be those three possible elimination products. All right. Um, of course, you could uh, do uh, a weak nucleophile that was also a weak base, in which case nothing's going to happen until the leaving group leaves. So we would need to ask, can the leaving group leave? Uh, secondary carbocation is okay. Um, examples of things that are good or weak nucleophiles, but also weak bases would include things whose conjugate acids have pKa's less than zero. Water's conjugate acid is hydronium, which has a pKa of minus two. Uh, so uh, basically neutral alcohols are a lot of the examples of things on this list. We would form the carbocation first and then would remember that uh, we would get both SN1 and E1 products. So uh, if we were adding water, we would need to show both stereoisomers. If we make a stereocenter in an SN1 reaction, we have to get both configurations. And then the elimination products, uh, we could 
again predict by looking at the carbocationic intermediate and identifying beta protons. All right. Um, so, and we can actually do this for each and every kind of alkyl halide and consider what happens for each of these combinations. I find it useful to summarize this in a bit of a table. That may or may not be your um, cup of, I don't know, Diet Coke uh, or whatever. Um, can I say this? I like Diet Coke. That's okay, right? Of course it's okay. Come on, Josh, have a strong sense of self. Um, years ago, well, when I was first here, you couldn't find anything caffeinated on campus other than chocolate, you know, go figure. But um, they asked, at about, it was about the time Romney ran for president, and they were sort of poking around asking, well, why isn't it sold? And somebody from the, from the PR department said, well, there's just simply no demand for it here. Which was funny because at about the same time, uh, Swig and So Delicious and other soda companies started popping up around campus, catering to the caffeine demand of various uh, students and faculty here. And so eventually BYU decided to get in on that action and now there's Diet Coke in the vending machine. So that's good. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Dang it, I was distracted. Um, so uh, you can take these three kinds of alkyl halides and you can consider what happens when they encounter the good nucleophiles that are good bases, the good nucleophiles that are weak bases, the weak nucleophiles that are good bases because of sterics and the weak nucleophiles that are also weak bases. And what we just did was the secondary carbocation row we said that uh, if you've got a good nucleophile, it's also a good base. For secondary alkyl halides, rather, you should expect a competition between SN2 and E2. In contrast, if it's not a good base but still a good nucleophile, SN2 will dominate because the good nucleophile doesn't wait for the leaving group to leave, and the, and the uh, weak base can't remove the proton until the leaving group leaves. For something that's a weak nucleophile but a good base, you can get E2 only for the secondary alkyl halide. And then if we use the weak nucleophile and a weak base, as we just saw, we got just uh, SN1 and E1 products. Um, it turns out that the weak nucleophile, weak base column is pretty boring because for primary alkyl halides where the carbocation is too unstable, there's basically nothing to see nothing happens. Uh, the, the, the nucleophile, the weak base slash weak nucleophile and the primary alkyl halide just dissolve together and hang out. There's no chemistry. No. Okay, won't use that one again. Um, SN1 and E1 happens for the tertiary alkyl halides as well, using a weak nucleophile or weak base because uh, the carbocation that forms is a reasonable intermediate. Uh, the column for good bases that are weak nucleophiles is really easy. It's just E2 all the way. The, the sterically hindered good base um, will not do substitution chemistry, so the only thing it can do is elimination chemistry, even for the primary alkyl halide where elimination is slow. For the good nucleophile that's a weak base, you're gonna do SN2 when you can. If you can't, because it's a tertiary alkyl halide, you gotta wait for the leaving group to leave and then you get the mixture again. For a uh, good nucleophile that's a good base, for primary alkyl halides, it's SN2 only because the E2 reaction is slow for primary alkyl halides. For tertiary alkyl halides, it's E2 only because uh, uh, SN2 doesn't happen for tertiary alkyl halides. I'm erasing the only because I worry that some of you will see only here and wonder why I didn't put it here, 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 and here, and, uh, and assume that there's some hidden meaning there, which there isn't. Okay. Questions about how we did that? Yeah. 
Uh, well, let's look at that. The question is, what if you have a methyl halide? The methyl halides are unique because they lack beta protons. So uh, even if you used a base, there's no elimination you can do. You could ask, is it possible to take tert-butoxide and methylate the oxygen with a methyl halide? Probably. But that's not really an exception worth worrying about. Other questions? All right. So uh, now let's do some examples. It's, uh, it can be, rather than sort of try to talk about all the eventualities, we should just sort of get in and start making mistakes and then uh, figure out what the, what the problems are. Okay, so I'm going to start with, uh, and I will say this actually before I move on, the simplest cases are the most synthetically useful. The cases where you get a mixture of products, especially with SN1 and E1, are not generally done that often in the lab because who wants to get a mixture of products? You want to get the desired product in as close to 100% yield as you possibly can. Nevertheless, we're talking about it because seeing the complexity that can arise from a simple starting material and how we don't have a lot of good tools for directing that pathway can help you later on appreciate biology when you see that biology can make very complicated molecules using SN1 or E1 type reactions and there aren't any undesired byproducts. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Why would that ever happen when you could just use like an SN2 reaction to create the same product? Right. So the question is, you know, with pharmaceutical drugs, we talked at pharmaceuticals, that's a repeating term, redundant anyway. Drugs uh, are often sold as racemic mixtures of enantiomers. Why would you ever do that if you could make the pure enantiomer via an SN2 reaction? And the answer is uh, it's cheaper, but not because they're using the SN1 reaction. It's because they're starting with a racemic starting material. So if, I, if you uh, had a one-to-one -one mixture of these two alkyl halides and then did an SN2 reaction with some nucleophile, even though you get backside attack, you're not going to be able to tell because your products are racemic anyway. So that's why. It's not that they're using cruddy reactions in general. It's that... Uh, it's that getting enantiomerically pure molecules is expensive, and so it's if you can if you can do if you can market a drug and have it be racemic, it's just cheaper to do. Yep. Why wouldn't the top left box also have E2? The answer is goes back to what we know about the rate of SN2 versus E2 for primary alkyl halides. It's fast, SN2 is fast for primary alkyl halides, but it's way slow for, uh, E2 is way slow for primary alkyl halides. So for that upper left box here, SN2 wins and it beats E2. And, you know, would you ever possibly imagine seeing the possibility for an elimination product there, sure, we're going to assume that reality is simpler than that. Okay, others? All right, so let's break our brains with some tough examples. Um, I apologize if you've seen some of this before, but this will be help. This will help. Uh, also illustrate what to do when you get a problem wrong to tease out what it is you're missing. Uh, so let's use uh, N3 minus. Now likely if you were taking this uh, exam like on the MCAT, they're not going to show you N3 minus because you can't buy N3 minus, but you can buy sodium azide. 
And I've observed for some people that uh, seeing a counter ion for a nucleophile tends to startle them a little bit and they're not totally sure what to do because they haven't seen it before. Just realize that uh, that's just sodium plus ion, that's a counter ion for the azide anion, that those two are apart in solution and, and the nucleophile does the reactivity and that you can ignore the sodium. Um, sometimes in chemistry, counter ions are important, but we're going to basically ignore them. I'm, I'm not writing it up here because I don't want to cause confusion, but you might see questions on standardized exams in your future where there are counter ions present and you will need to have the presence of mind to focus in on what's uh, most important, okay? Uh, so let's, what I usually do when I, the way I get started on a problem like this, you know, predict the products or in other words, which of the following are products of this reaction? I start by looking at the alkyl halide and I notice that the alpha carbon, the one that holds the leaving group, is a tertiary carbon. So that's a tertiary alkyl halide. Right away, I can rule out SN2 as a possibility. <clears throat> Second, I look at my nucleophile and I draw its conjugate acid, which is hydroazidic acid, I think. Uh, HN3, you can look up its pKa, and it also happens to be around 9. So this would qualify as a good nucleophile that is a weak base. So the fact that it's a weak base is going to rule out E2. All right, I've just ruled out my two fast reaction possibilities, SN2 versus E2. The nucleophile can't attack even though it's good because of sterics. And it's not a good base, so it's not going to remove any beta protons. Therefore, uh, until the leaving group leaves. Therefore, we have to form a carbocation, leaving group leaves, to give us this carbocation. Br minus was the leaving group. And then we can either do substitution products or elimination products. Um, why am I calling just the second step SN1 versus E1? Because SN1 and E1 have the same first step, which is leaving group leaves. And this is the rate determining step. Uh, so if we, if we have the nucleophile attack the positive charge, we can draw our substitution products. So, um, oops. Actually, I'm going to be mean. I'm going to be mean. Can I be mean any more than I currently am? Or, no, I didn't want to do that. Okay, so that's the, that's the SN1 product, right? Did I get that right, or am I missing something? Well, doesn't it have to what? Yeah, I have to have my nucleophile attack from above or below, right? The carbocation intermediate has empty p orbital or LUMO above and below the plane of that sp2 hybridized carbon. If I just draw this as my answer, I'm telling you that I think that there was inversion of stereochemistry. I think somehow from a non-chiral or, or rather from a planar intermediate, I was able to just choose one of the possible stereochemistries. So, okay, fine. You've got to get both configurations at the carbon uh, that has the nucleophile on it. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm, I have a hard time thinking while talking, which is really challenging, you know? If you can't think while you talk, you end up saying a bunch of stupid things in your life. Uh, which I have done and will do. Um, were any of you, by the way, thrown off by the fact that uh, in the way the molecule was drawn here, the methyl groups were oriented to my lower right, whereas now they're sort of oriented above? Did that throw anybody off? Okay. If it didn't, great. If it did, that means that um, 
you need to work on your spatial reasoning and thinking about how to move molecules around in your brain and on paper and models can help with that. You want to put in the work for that before the exam. Uh, uh, you want to put in the, the work on that before the exam because models during the exam just freak you out more. It's just more stuff to do and you're building large molecules and worrying about it. Build up your spatial reasoning and intuition so by the time the exam comes, you don't, you don't necessarily need the models anymore. Okay, so if I had drawn just this one, that would have said, oh, backside attack, it must have been SN2, but it wasn't, and so I have to show both configurations, attack from above or below. Now here's another mistake I could make, and, it, and this kind of mistake tripped up some of you on the most recent exam, and uh, that is, I could start thinking, oh, well, I have to get both possible stereochemistries, and then maybe I get carried away and say, well, what about these other options? Uh, I've got to include those, don't I? And the answer is no, danger, danger, don't do that. What's the problem with these? I inverted the stereochemistry of this other methyl group, which isn't involved at all in the reaction. Uh, and you know, if you want, if you want to be convinced that we've in inverted stereochemistry, just try to assign R versus S here and do it again there, and you'll see that they're the opposite. The stereocenter that's not involved in the reaction doesn't change. And so, if you if you write this down as an option. It tells me that you remembered something about being able to attack from above or below, but you didn't connect it specifically to the alpha carbon and you panicked and decided to hedge your bets and just write everything. Which, again, can lead you to make some, some mistakes. So yeah, just to be clear, these are not substitution products of this reaction. You've got to get the stem stereochemistry right to convey that. Um, as I did during the first hour, I'm hesitant to leave these here because I, I don't want uh, Apple Pencil batteries low, I think 5% last 10 minutes probably. I don't want a poor unfortunate soul to wander along and think that these are actually products. So I will delete them so that we don't uh, look at it. Now, if I just stopped here and showed you substitution products, that's wrong too. I need elimination products. Go ahead. Uh, okay, great, Grant. This is actually a great question. Would you, would it be possible that the SN1 product on the left is more prevalent than the one on the right because the one on the left has the azide coming in from below where the methyl group isn't pointing? Uh, and uh, Grant's point is that these two are diastereomers, so they don't have to be one-to-one in ratio. Uh, and so I think that hypothesis that maybe the one on the left might be preferred is good. Alternatively, you could argue that the one on the right is better because it keeps the methyl groups trans instead of cis to each other. Uh, you don't really have to predict which one of these of the two is going to be more uh, dominant, but if you realize they don't have to be one to one, that's, uh, that's good. Braden, you asked, what do I suggest to improve spatial reasoning skills? Uh, get a model set, build a decently complicated molecule, then draw it on paper from multiple perspectives. What if I look at it over here? What if I look at it from underneath or above? What if I twist this bond around? How does that change how I draw it? And if you practice that, that's going to be really useful. Um, I want to do some other examples, so we need to sort of move quickly through the E1 products. For this, we need to identify all of the beta protons. Uh, so there's one here in blue, one in red, and then uh, there are, uh, I guess I need orange, and then there's two other ones here. Now, technically, the two that I've just drawn are diastereotopic. They're different from each other because of this stereocenter. Nevertheless, either of them can be removed to, and either of them can line up with the positive charge, P orbital. Either of them can be removed, and in any case, they lead to the same product. 
if we remove the red, pro, red beta proton, we get the following product. If we remove the orange beta proton, we get this product. And if we remove the blue beta proton, we get probably the major elimination product, which is the more substituted alkene. Oops, just spelt nice water over. Um, now, I'm not gonna ask you to decide whether the substitution or elimination products here are major versus minor. Uh, you would just draw them all. I could ask you which is the major elimination product, but I would never ask you, do you expect there to be more of the substitution products than the elimination products? So this is a pretty complicated reaction, but um, nobody would ever do this in real life because who wants to go fishing for one or two desired products out of a pool of, of this many? Nevertheless, this, this is a problem that tests all kinds of understanding about mechanism and stereochemistry. So you can expect to see something similar uh, in your future. Now, in the first hour, people wanted to do some uh, questions where uh, uh, about E2, where being anti to the leaving group was an issue. Uh, and so I thought maybe in our last couple of minutes, that's, that's where we could go. Um, and to do this, I want to draw a couple of different uh, potential starting materials. And I want us to consider what the E2 products might be. All right. So uh, let's suppose that for each of these, we're going to use a weak nucleophile that is a good base because of sterics, such as uh, tert butoxide. Uh, the secondary alkyl halide that we've got here can undergo either SN2 or E2, but because we're using a weak nucleophile that's a good base, we're going to prefer the E2 reaction. So once we decide we're going to predict E2 reaction products, our task is to look for beta protons that can be anti to the leaving group. All right, so let's begin with um, the molecule on our left. There's a beta proton here, one that's uh, beta to the leaving group. Uh, there's one here that's on the same side of the molecule as Cl. And then there's another here, which is on the opposite side of the molecule as Cl. I've drawn these two in different co colors because this is another example of protons that are diastereotopic. That is, they are different because they're in a chiral molecule. The blue proton is on the same side as the methyl group. The purple proton is on the opposite side of the ring as the methyl group, and they're, and they're permanently different. So of these three options, which, if any of them, can be anti to the leaving group? How about orange? No, sorry, cis, right? Same side of the ring, and there's no way, you know, even with chair flipping, that down stays down and up stays up. Even though you can trade axial and equatorial, you never trade up versus down for the substituents. So, we're going to rule out the orange beta proton, and we're gonna rule out the purple beta proton for the same reason. The only product we're gonna get is the product that comes from removing the blue beta proton. And I'm gonna just indicate that by showing the unreacted beta protons that are still in the molecule, okay? Now, uh, if we do a simple thing, we make the diastereomer where we change stereochemistry at the alpha carbon. Now chloro is up. Let's keep the same color scheme for the remainder of our beta protons. Now, if I use the same base, the good base that's a weak nucleophile, it's going to be an E2 reaction. What, which are my... Uh, are, which, if any, of these protons can I rule out? Blue. 
the blue hydrogen. And, and just, a, just a reminder from a question on the chat, a proton that can be anti to the leaving group is one that's acidic. When it's anti the, to the leaving group, it lines up with the sigma star and does hyperconjugation. The LUMO, which used to be just the sigma star, spreads out onto the beta proton and makes it a good target for a base. And that's only true for protons that can be anti to the leaving group. Um, okay, so the blue one can't, but it looks like the orange one and the purple one can. So if we uh, remove and eliminate the orange proton, we can expect to get this product. If we eliminate the purple proton, we can expect to get The, uh, the same product we, we had over there, only it's gonna be the blue proton that remains. Okay, so different stereochemistries can give you different E2 products. Uh, one point of advice here is that it's easier when dealing with six-membered rings to judge whether leaving groups can be anti to beta protons when you just draw the six-membered ring from above. Uh, and the example that I think we'll have to close with and maybe finish up next time is one that I did uh, in the first hour. And that was, um, uh, by the way, here D is deuterium. This is an isotope of hydrogen. It's exactly the same as hydrogen. The nucleus is just one atomic unit heavier, so it's just a labeled version of hydrogen. It's exactly the same size as hydrogen. When you look at the molecule from this perspective and you see the leaving group, the only thing that's anti to the leaving group in this conformation is the ring. There's no proton that's anti to the leaving group. And so if you looked at it there, you might say, ah, that's, that can't do any elimination chemistry. But you should beware because, be, beware, beware the other chair. Maybe that's the thing we need, that's our new mantra. Beware, beware the other chair. If you draw the other chair here, where the iodide is now axial, the deuterium now can be anti to the leaving group. And now a base can remove it and we can do the elimination reaction. And uh, incidentally, you would predict that the elimination product would look like this and would still have the proton, not the other option where the proton would be removed, okay? So if you're given an E2 type problem with a cyclohexane ring, if you draw it from above, you can forget about the other chair because the overhead view is sort of the average of the two chairs. But if you're gonna look at the one chair, always draw the other and see whether you can get a proton anti to the leaving group in either of the two chairs. Uh, with that, we need to close. So I will see you on Monday. We'll move on to chapter nine on Monday. I wanna show you just a couple examples of uh, biological SN2 or E2 reactions and then we'll move on.